right, let's give it up, folks, to the man, the myth, the legend, one of my best friends in the entire world, Mr. Andrew Yang. to be back. It is great to be here and have the privilege of addressing you as both your mayor and your president. The first person to hold those jobs at the same time. It is fantastic to be here with you all in large part because I have so many friends and family here tonight, including my incredible wife, Evelyn. Where are you, baby? Evelyn, where are you? I'm like looking at a stranger. No. <laughs> That's not cool, but here you are. Thank you, Evelyn. And also my incredible campaign manager, Zach, Carly Riley, Katie Dolan. So many other people who joined our campaign when it was just this little tadpole, polywog thing. And I have to say that everyone who joined the Yang campaign circa 2017, early 2018, was doing it for the best of reasons, because no one was joining that campaign as a wise career move. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, you know my ticket to a plum job on Capitol Hill? <laughs> the Andrew Yang campaign. So everyone who joined truly noble, principled, and wanted to make a case to the American people. And we did it, am I right? Yeah. When I was running for president, 27% of Americans thought universal basic income was a good idea. Today, as we're here tonight, it's up to 65%, two out of three Americans, and we did that. If it had been 65%, I legitimately might, might be a president today. <laughs> it, was, it was that circa 2019. But it took a few things happening to get us here. Being here in New York, I showed up in the city as a 21-year-old college graduate, didn't know anything about anything, and I owe the city Evelyn, I owe the city being an entrepreneur and CEO, I owe the city being a parent. This city took me and made me into something else, really. I think it does that to a lot of people. And I remember when I was in my 20s living here in New York, just being here felt like a victory. You know what I mean? You know, it's like any month that you manage to be here, it's like, oh, I did it. I did it for one more month. <laughs> and why is that? It's in part because it's a little bit tough to live here. The rents are a little bit high. And every time you went to a friend's apartment, what did you think? Oh, how much are they paying for this place? <laughs> right? It takes you about five to ten minutes to, like, kind of casually go up and be like, so, uh, what are you paying for this place? And then... Uh, and, and they tell you this long, elaborate story of how they got this deal of a deal, and then you're like, ah, oh. <laughs> the rest of it. But this city ended up giving rise to a career I never could have imagined in a presidential campaign that ended up surpassing anyone's reasonable expectation. But the beginning days were not easy. And Zach remembers it well, Carly remembers it well. Where when I first said I was running for president, my friends legitimately asked, of what? When I was at my kid's birthday party and they asked, so what are you doing right now? I would actually have to have these awkward conversations where I was like, oh, I'm a presidential candidate. <laughs> and they would say, really? And I would say, yes, yes I am. And then we'd have a long 30 minute conversation about automation and UBI and Trump and the rest of it. And at the end of that 25, 30 minute conversation, you know what they'd say? Good luck with that. <laughs> you know, like th that's what it was like for the early months of the campaign. So seeing what we ended up growing into, that only happens out of a place like New York, in my view. But my decision to run for president was actually born many years earlier. In 2011, when I started a nonprofit called Venture for America. How many of you work at a nonprofit right now? Raise your hand. How many of you volunteer for a nonprofit? You really should raise your hand to that second one. <laughs> that was like, are you nice? <laughs> and you could be like, yeah, I'm nice. I did it that one time. We can't even tell if, you know, you're lying. So, 
So I made the decision to start a nonprofit in 2011, and that's really the decision that ended up leading me down this trail. And Evelyn, I owe you so much because we joke all the time that there was like a bait and switch where if when we were dating, she knew I was going to end up running for president of the rest of she would like run screaming the other direction immediately. <laughs> When she and I met, I was a fairly normal guy working a fairly normal business. I was like heading this small education company. And when it was bought in 2009, I then had this bright idea to start a nonprofit that would help train entrepreneurs to create jobs all over the country. And that became Venture for America. So those of you who actually work in nonprofits or volunteer in nonprofits, you know that nonprofits run on passion that the person who starts that organization has to continuously make that case as they generate interest, enthusiasm, donations. And so that's what I did for six and a half years. I was Mr. Can-Do, positivity, entrepreneurship. And that organization took me to places I had never been before. Places like Michigan, Ohio, Alabama, Louisiana. And in a lot of these states, I have to say, I was like, wow, things are pretty rough here. Like, this is not actually going as well as I'd hoped. And during this time, there were some real highs. I got to bring Evelyn to meet President Obama. My in-laws were very excited about me that week. <laughs> and I remember vividly, we're going from the Roosevelt Room to another structure on the White House property. And I was like, ah, screw it. When am I going to have another chance like this? So I go up to President Obama. I put my hand on his shoulder. And I'm like, President Obama, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Evelyn. And so he just turns around, and this was his amusement of the day, I kid you not. He's like, nice to meet you. He like leans in on her, he puts the high beams on. <laughs> you know what I mean? The devil's like leaning back, being like, nice to meet you too. It, it, I, could, I seriously see that that's how he uh, gets his entertainment for the day, is that just like, you know, sort of awing someone's wife. <laughs> He'll probably see this someday and be like, oh yeah, I do do that. <laughs> so there are some real highs to this journey, but the, the six years traveling the country did give me a kind of sinking feeling about what was happening in the Midwest and the South. And then Donald Trump became our president. Y'all remember that night? Y'all yeah. remember it well, I'm sure. How many of you were actually at Jacob Javits, which is pretty close to here, at what was meant to be the celebration party? Anyone here? That was a very, very tough night. I was in the, I think, the very, very large camp that believed that Hillary was going to win. But she didn't. Trump won. And I saw this as a giant red flag for the country. I said, wow, things have gotten darker than even I had thought. And I had spent the previous five, six years traveling the country, and I felt like I had a sense as to what drove Donald Trump into the White House which is that we were undergoing this historic economic transformation driven by technology. I have a lot of friends in technology, and when you get a couple beers into them and say, hey, are we getting rid of all the jobs? They're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, we definitely are. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you just have to get them like, away from the stage and the microphone and the rest of it and just be like, so yeah, is this happening? They're like, oh yeah, it's happening. And I felt like I could help explain this to the American people that Donald Trump was a symptom of a set of changes that had been going on in the country for years and years. And so this was the case that Zach and other people decided to invest their careers in helping us make around the country. And making that case, again, in those early days was not easy. I would try and generate attention. It's not like media organizations were clamoring to talk to the UBI guy. Reporters would often ask me this question, and after a while, you actually kind of got used to certain questions and conversations. So this was the number one question I would get from the press. Are you serious? <laughs> Do you think you can win? And this question, like so many other questions, is a trap, because if you say, no, I am not serious, <laughs> then they will say, fuck you. <laughs> and we should never talk to you again. And if I were to say, yes, I'm dead serious, then it would be, fuck you, and we will never talk to you again. 
And so the only thing you can do is give some vague, ambiguous answer in the middle where you say there are multiple ways to win, there are different versions of victory, this campaign has multiple goals. You can say something in that milieu, and then they're like, okay, okay, he like, you know, he jumped over that little landmine, and it's like, like, try and roll out another. So that's what some of the early days were like. I was on a panel with a guy named Michael Tubbs, who was then the mayor of Stockton, California. Do you all know who Michael Tubbs is? Great guy. So inspiring. The youngest mayor in the country for a while. He was piloting UBI in Stockton. And so we were on a panel together. He made his case for the Stockton trial. I then made my case for universal basic income as championed by Thomas Paine, Martin Luther King Jr., Milton Friedman. And at the end of our panel, Michael leans over to me and whispers in my ear, Andrew, you can say shit I could never say. And he went on to explain, he said, if the young black mayor were to say to everyone, we should give all Americans $1,000 a month, no questions asked, they would laugh me out of the room. But if the magical Asian man from the future <laughs> says we should give everyone $1,000 a month, and then people are like, oh, let's hear this out. He has some interesting ideas. And Evelyn and I joked all the time about how I got introduced in the media as what? You all know, California tech billionaire, Andrew Yag. <laughs> you all remember that? And then Evelyn was like, where is this billion dollars they speak of? <laughs> but I would actually play along and lean into a lot of this because I was like, whatever. You know, like you want to like put me in that bucket, totally fine. I'll take whatever gimmick or label you want to put on me if it gives me a chance to make this case for people. But it was still rough going. I had friends who would host events for me. And watching your friend, who's actually going to bat for you, introduce you uncomfortably <laughs> when you're running for president, where they're like, here's my friend Andrew. I don't really think he has a chance, but let's hear him out. He's, uh, you know, he's got some good ideas. And <laughs> you're like, whoa, this is like the good one. <laughs> So it was like that for months throughout 2018. And I'm actually going to give you a bit of a glimpse of the future. The energy started to pick up right after the midterms in 2018. Because it turns out no one wants to talk about a 2020 election before then. So the same thing is going to happen in this upcoming cycle, where we're going to be living our lives until November of 2022. And then after the midterms, all hell is gonna break loose. Because everyone's gonna be like 2024 20, all the time. So we experienced that uptick after the midterms, but what really gave our campaign a chance to thrive and to, to grow was podcasts. How many of you heard about me originally through a podcast? Yes, so I hear Freakonomics. Sam Harris was a game changer. I was on Sam Harris, and then the next day, thousands of dollars worth of donations came in from Perfect Strangers, and that just continued on for a while. So not being idiots, me and Zach looked at each other and were like, well, that is great. <laughs> Let's try and do that again. So any podcast that had a really strong following, we would try and get in front of. Turns out there aren't that many Sam Harris's out there. But Sam ended up leading to Joe Rogan. And that conversation was the biggest immediate lift that I have ever seen or experienced. Joe Rogan, for those of you who don't realize this, is the male Oprah. <laughs> there are so many men who just want to know what Joe is thinking or feeling. <laughs> so I go to Joe Rogan's man hanger in LA, which is really what it is. Like, you know, like the, the men here, we, we dream about having a man cave. That man had a man hanger. <laughs> Where you go, there's like the training ring, the sports car, the life-size werewolf from the American werewolf in London. <laughs> but like, whatever feverish male dream you can have was just like there in real life. And you're like, wow, I have stumbled into like the temple of American masculinity here in Los Angeles. <laughs> so, 
after that conversation, which was seen by millions of people, I got recognized on the street like that. It was pretty wild. Instead of thousands of dollars a day, we were getting tens of thousands of dollars of donation a day. Right? Oh, good. We ended up raising $10 million in the, the third quarter of that year and then $16 million the, the quarter after that, which was half of what Bernie Sanders raised that quarter. So I was running around in circles yelling, we're half a Bernie, we're half a Bernie, <laughs> to my team. And so throughout 2019, the energy around the campaign just grew and grew. I remember vividly the first time we were going to a, a rally where we ran into traffic on the way, and the team in the rental vehicle were looking at each other, be like, what's the hell this traffic? We're going to be late to our rally. And then someone saw a Yang sign in one of the cars, and we were like, this is our fucking traffic. <laughs> These people are going to our rally. <laughs> Around the same time, we had a huge rally here in New York at Washington Square Park. How many of you were there for that? When I was walking, it was raining that day, that's true. Still didn't keep thousands of people from coming out. I'd walk the streets and everywhere I'd go, it'd be like, Yang, with you. Yang, where's my thousand bucks? <laughs> Yang, let's do this. So it, it was pretty incredible. And when I started the campaign, Evelyn and I had a conversation. She was like, are we gonna lose our privacy? I was like, no, I was like, no way. <laughs> Which is kind of a funny thought. I mean, I was running for president, but I said to her, I was like, hey, if Amy O'Rourke walked in, uh, or Jeanette Rubio like, walked in, would you know who they were? And she's like, no. And I was like, yeah, then you're going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, I also said, uh, even for the politician themselves, I was like, I, I could not fathom a world where I would get recognized on the street. And I will share with you all that as an Asian guy, I feel like I have something of an invisibility cloak where if you decide not to be conspicuous, then you just like blend into the woodwork, just like that. So you, like, you just like stand still and just like, you know. <laughs> so the first time I got, started getting recognized on the street in that way, it was very jarring. I was like, oh my gosh, someone just come up to me and be like, hey, hey man, you Andrew Yang, you Andrew Yang? I'd be like, <laughs> it was like it was an illicit drug deal being discussed. It was like, are you him, are you him? And I was like, yes, I am. And he's like, I love you, man, keep it up, keep it up. I was like, I will, I will. Uh, and, and the weirdest thing is that time I was wearing like jeans and a hoodie. Like, you know, it's like if I look like this, it's like, okay, I get it. But I was, you know, fairly nondescript. So the energy started growing throughout 2019, make the first debate stage, which is when a lot of you were introduced to me. Remember you turned on the TV and you were like, oh, Asian guy, different. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, no tie, the rest of it. Freaking Brian Williams was obsessed with that shit. You remember that? He was like... He showed up on the stage without a tie. He, like, it was like, it was like his brain was going to explode. <laughs> so you make the debate stage, and then you make the second debate stage, the third debate stage. Uh, when Evelyn and I were out with the, the boys, we started getting stopped everywhere. Where Evelyn was like, I can't take you anywhere. Because, you know, like, get somewhere would take four times as long as, as you, you'd planned. Uh, and so the energy just kept rising and rising throughout 2019. It was amazing showing up, having hundreds, thousands of people uh, investing their hopes for a better future in you. And I felt so supercharged during that time. I felt like a medieval character in Braveheart or Gladiator, one of those movies where like my hair gets really long and like riding on a horse and, and slow motion, <laughs> those people around, you know what I mean? And that's what you started to feel. But I knew from the beginning that all of this was going to culminate in the great state of Iowa. When I started the campaign, I said, look, Iowans are like a thousand Californians each. No, I mean, where I'm here in New York, I guess you don't care if I make Californians seem politically insignificant, but uh, the, like, each Iowan's worth their weight in gold, and I made an estimate early on in the campaign, beginning of the campaign, actually, because I'm a very numbers-oriented guy. I said, if we get 40,000 Iowans on board with a vision to eradicate poverty, we can do it. And from the beginning of the campaign, that was always the mission, the vision, the goal, is to accelerate the end of poverty. The very beginning of the campaign, I tried to make my own cost-benefit analysis in terms of running. And I said, what are the downsides? Time away from my family, we have young kids. Opportunity costs, 
and possible total public humiliation. <laughs> Which, honest, I'll share this with you all, was probably the most likely outcome. The upsides were help explain why Donald Trump won the White House, explain the technological transformation of our economy, mainstream universal basic income as a policy solution, and speed up the end of poverty in our time. And if that's your cost benefit, then you have to do it. Am I right, New York? But I knew that nothing mattered if we didn't get the Iowans on board. You get 40,000 Iowans on board, all of a sudden, you can speed up this entire process and maybe even end poverty, not in some distant future, but right now. So that's what I would tell my team all the time is we have to go to Iowa. We have to fight it out door to door, street to street, and hundreds, even thousands of volunteers from around the country came to Iowa in the dead of winter, January 2020, to knock on doors. How many of you were there in Iowa with us? Yes! For those of you who did not make a sound or a move, where the fuck were you? <laughs> I don't know if you'd heard what I just said. We had a chance to end poverty. We just got enough Iowans on board. So, Evelyn and I were on a bus tour, 17-day bus tour. This is the first time my kids actually started to think that dad was cool this entire time. Because when I was running for president, they'd be like, whatever, dad's, dad's away. When I was in the debates and TV, their mom would be like, hey, hey, look, daddy's on the debate stage, dad on the debate stage. And they couldn't sit through it, it was too boring. <laughs> I think their direct quote was, everyone but dad is boring. So we brought them to Iowa in January 2020, and they still associate Iowa as this magical winter wonderland. A place where they're allowed to saw things in half in the museums, for real. Just play with people in the snow. And where dad had a giant tour bus with his head on it, and video games. So that was the first time the presidential campaign really became real, I think, for, for my boys. Uh, they figured it out. Also, Dave Chappelle came and campaigned for us in Iowa. We filmed little videos uh, that we, we joked were rush hour. <laughs> Be like... <laughs> so... We were going door to door, street to street in Iowa. I would get out of the bus. I would like give my talk about how, look, you're seeing it happen. You saw it happen first. Your factories closed. Your farms are consolidating. Your retail stores are closing. You have to get in front of this curve before it gets to your highways, was the case I was making. And I would make this case in small towns. Uh, and I was going to say in, in big towns, but like in Iowa, the range is not that vast. <laughs> So we would make this case all over the place, and hundreds of people were showing up. Like, it did feel like we were so surrounded by energy and enthusiasm. Again, hundreds of people would come in from New York and California and from all over the country to, to campaign with us. We would see it everywhere. And so we began to feel like, wow, all things are possible. We could do what no one thought would it even be conceivable in contemporary American politics? And then February 5th, we start gearing up for the votes. I gotta say too, I won the Iowa youth poll. I am the first candidate in the history of the country that won the Iowa youth poll and did not win the actual caucus. So if I would just cut off the voting at approximately age 19, I would be your president. But unfortunately, they just let everyone vote. <laughs> and so of the 40,000 Iowans we needed to get on board with this case, we got 8,914. We got 24% of what we needed to end poverty. Now, depending upon your perspective, that's either an incredible achievement or a missed opportunity. But I will say, as Braveheart riding the horse in slow motion with my hair flowing, it, it felt like the horse disappeared. <laughs> Well, all of a sudden, instead of being on a horseback, I'm on the ground being like, where's the helmet? Where's the helmet? 
So we head to New Hampshire, campaign our hearts out for the following week, have a similar result there, and then the team comes together with me. Actually, they did a little bit before New Hampshire results, and they said, Andrew, we think you should consider suspending your campaign if the voting in New Hampshire does not go your way. And when I first heard this, my heart sank. It's like a punch in the gut. Because imagine running your heart out and grinding it out for months, even years, and then being told, hey, this thing might be ending from the people that are in the trenches with you. Really, really tough message. And so I said to them, why on earth would we do that? Let's just keep going. And they said, look, if you keep going after you have any plausible chance to win, it's going to be like the lights get turned out on you, where the press are going to completely ignore you and act like you don't exist. And I was like, well, I remember that from the beginning of the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so like going back to that place, you know, I don't seem to mind it if we can actually get the votes out, up, get the message out. And the case they made to me was, if you want to advance the cause for universal basic income, there are things you can do immediately. You can get other candidates on board, you can start an organization. And so the more they talked, the more I started to realize, you know, they, they might be right. And during the campaign, I had been trying to get other candidates on board with universal basic income. I'm going to share with you all a debate story. So I ended up having a back and forth with Bernie Sanders on the debate stage about universal basic income. He was for a universal jobs guarantee. I was for universal basic income. And then I said to Bernie, uh, you know, on national TV, I was like, Bernie, that doesn't do anything for my wife, who's at home with our two boys, or the millions of caregivers around the country. <laughs> Bernie then immediately dropped it because he was told not to have any exchanges with a candidate on stage whose last name was not Biden. <laughs> and then during the next commercial break, Bernie comes up to me, puts his arm around me, he's like, nice work, Andrew, nice work. <laughs> the rest of it. <laughs> Which I appreciated. But during this time after I dropped out, I was trying to push various candidates to endorse universal basic income. I was just saying, look, whoever goes for universal basic income, Bernie, I will be there <laughs> to endorse you. Mike Bloomberg reached out around this time being like, hey, Andrew, you want to endorse me? And uh, I talked to my team about it and was like, if Mike puts up a billion dollars for universal basic income, like I will get on board. And then his team came back and said, a billion dollars contingent upon Mike winning. <laughs> and then I was like, no, just a billion dollars. <laughs> and then that conversation ended up stalling. And so the process played out until it was very clear that Joe was going to win. And then I endorsed Joe on CNN. I don't know if you all remember that. And then was a surrogate for Joe went to Georgia with Evelyn and some of you to help try and win the Senate for the Democrats. But coming off that campaign trail, I still felt this massive, massive need, obligation to try and continue to make the case, to grow the movement. I will share with you all that I was so single-minded during the two and a half, three years I was running for president, where I told people who are close to me, I have two jobs. Speed up the end of poverty and stay married. <laughs> and as long as those two things are happening, nothing else matters. And so when the campaign ended, there was part of me that was like, okay, we did it. We accomplished our goal. We mainstreamed universal basic income. But then there was still this sense like, I'm still here. The Yang Gang, thank you all, are still here. <laughs> and the problems are still here. You know, the, like the problems didn't get solved, you know, know what I mean? And so I spent the next number of months in 2020 trying to answer this question, this question that's been plaguing you all for the last number of months, even years, which is why do we feel so stuck? Why do we feel so negatively about our future and the future of this country? And I'm going to summarize in a number of big ideas why we feel so stuck, and then New York, how we can fix it. I know, it's very daunting, but here, we're gonna just go with this first part first. All right. The first big idea I wanna to present to you all is that we are at an era in American history where if everyone does the reasonable thing, we're fucked. 
what do I mean? Well, there's like a set of incentives that will guide us in a particular direction that will lead us to violence and ruin. All right, what am I talking about? What is the approval rating for the U.S. Congress right now as we're here together? No one's guessing high. <laughs> Everyone's like, it's fine, pretty low. <laughs> like, take a shot somewhere. 28%. Three out of four of us unhappy. What is the re-election rate for individual members of Congress? 94%. That's a pretty massive gulf. Am I right? So how is it that so many of us can be really upset about what's going on at any moment in time, but our legislators have a re-election rate the equivalent of the win rate of the Michael Jordan-led Chicago Bulls? <laughs> It's like the incumbents are the 96, 97 bulls, and their challengers are, I don't know. I was gonna, the Knicks are good now, so I can't use the Knicks. <laughs> the Nuggets also good. I'm gonna say Minnesota Timberwolves. <laughs> so how is it that there's such a vast gulf? And the answer is in the numbers. You know, I'll know I'm a math guy. It turns out that 83% of the districts in America are either very blue or very red. So if I get through to the general election, I win in 83% of the cases. That means if I get elected into office, how do I keep my job? Avoid getting primaried from within my own party, which means I just have to placate and please the most extreme partisan voters of 10% of my district. And I, you gotta say, those 10% are, are a little bit weird a lot of the time. <laughs> Not all of them are here tonight, let's put it that way. <laughs> so this is the system of incentives politically, that if you want job security, you just have to uh, avoid the most extreme flank of your party getting mad at you enough to primary you. This system of incentives will quickly take someone who's relatively rational and reasonable and make them seem unreasonable pretty quickly. And I will tell you all, as someone who's been around now dozens, hundreds of legislators, they are much more reasonable when the cameras are off. You talk to them individually, they seem like a fairly normal person. Some of you have had this experience, right? Then you get the camera on, you're all of a sudden like, where is that coming from? <laughs> it's because their political incentives are to seem more extreme and ideological so that they avoid getting challenged from within their own party. Then you layer on top of that, media organizations who now are rewarded for separating us into ideological camps, you know what I'm talking about, and then social media pouring gasoline on the whole thing. And in this set of incentives, trying to reach across the aisle will get punished very, very quickly. Does this remind you of America's political landscape right now as we're, we're together? Yes. Right? This is why we feel the way we do. And unfortunately, this is going to get worse, not better. So big idea number one is that if everyone does the reasonable thing according to their incentives, we are sunk. The second big idea is that we're at a point in American history where all things are possible. And I generally mean the bad stuff. <laughs> like whatever nightmare scenario you can imagine upcoming, it's on the table. No, 42% of both Democrats and Republicans now regard the other side as evil or their mortal enemies. You can sense that we're getting more and more agitated, angrier, and tipping closer and closer to political violence, even Civil War 2.0. How many of you think that's hyperbolic? No. How many of you think that's pretty accurate? And for scholars, there are scholars who do this, who measure political stress. Right now, the United States political stress level is literally at Civil War levels. So for those of you who think that this is realistic, it's real. I mean, we saw it on January 6th, and anyone who thinks that was a one-time event, I mean, we know that that's more of a harbinger of what's to come. Rehearsal. Someone called it a rehearsal. And I, I will say, the reactions to it, I mean, uh, you can see very clearly that people now see things through an ideological frame. There are media organizations that just want to serve up a particular narrative because that's where their profits come from. Their profits do not come from challenging their viewers. Their profits get, come from giving their viewers comfort food. An MSNBC producer actually said internally, 
we're not news, we're comfort. And in that environment, then, you can see all sorts of journalistic decisions being made that do not end up making a difficult case or bring us together, but try and affirm what people are already feeling. So that's where we are right now. It's a very, very tough spot. It's why so many of us feel so negatively about the future. Now, you're not going to believe this, New York City, but among all of this kind of hard, clear description of the incentives that are going to tear us apart if we let them, I also found an answer. Not going to believe it. And the answer comes from the great state of Alaska. Now, if you're a longtime Yang Ganger, when I say Alaska, what do you think? Oil. Yeah, like, one state already does this, and what state is it? Alaska. How do they pay for it? Oil. What is the oil of the 21st century? Data. Have you gotten your data check? No, then let's go get it. Those of you who aren't Yang Gang, that's, that's what you missed. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you all that the answer comes from Alaska, but it's not the oil dividend. Give me a, a show of hands or applause if you've heard of Senator Lisa Murkowski, who's been in the news. If you have not heard of Lisa Murkowski, congratulations, you're not a political junkie. You're probably more positive and upbeat as a result. <laughs> but for those of you who know who Senator Lisa Murkowski is, she has the distinction of being the only Republican senator who voted to impeach Donald Trump, who is also up for re-election in 2022. Think about that. Think about that Venn diagram. A few other senators did it, but they're not up for re-election. They're like, maybe they'll forget about this by the time I'm up. <laughs> No, seriously, you know. And you know this in part because Senator Lisa Murkowski now has an approval rating of 6% among Alaskan Republicans. They noticed, they didn't like it. <laughs> they were like, she went against Trump? You know, disapprove, disapprove. So why did she do it? This does show how politically suicidal it is for a Republican to go against Trump. So why did... Senator Murkowski do it when so many others would not. You could say it's because she's unusually independent and principled, which I believe to be the case. But you could also look up and say, wait a minute. Alaska is the only state in the entire country that last year actually switched their process from closed party primary to open primary, coupled with something called ranked choice voting, which you here in New York know well. So to be clear, her incentive switched from trying to placate or please the most extreme 10% of partisan voters, who in that case were Republicans, to having to make her case to 51% of the Alaskan public. And so if she goes to 51% of the Alaskan public and says, look, I'm my own person, I'm my own point of view, I've represented you to the best of my ability, bring me back, she has a fighting chance. How many of you think that that change in incentives might have contributed to Senator Murkowski's decision to go ahead and do what she thought was right? I'm going to say, of course it did, because she is rational. If you change the incentives so that legislators have to try and deliver for 51% of us, that's a very, very different set of incentives than trying to please the 10% over here on the flank. That is what we need to make happen in states around the country as quickly as possible. We have to set them free. We have to, instead of rewarding them for being extreme and unreasonable, for actually reaching across the aisle and delivering. Now, a Republican senator said to me the other week now, she said, we get rewarded more for keeping an issue around than trying to resolve it. What did she mean by that? I'm going to use an example. How many of you remember Marco Rubio championing immigration reform a number of years ago? Raise your hand with that. If you don't remember that, it's because the following week he said, just kidding, just kidding. I recant, I recant. And the reason why he doubled back was because he got shivved by his own party almost immediately being like, hey, Marco, what are you doing? If you do this, we're going to take a beating. You're going to lose your job. So calm down and bring it back. And so if they don't actually propose a solution, then what happens? They can gin up energy and donations and votes saying the other side's messing up, keep supplying us with all of these things so we can fight for you. That is the system we have right now. If someone tries to solve it, they get punished. 
That's what we have to change. We have to do what they did in Alaska in states around the country. And New York City, I'm here to tell you that this is 100% dual because, doable because all of this is controlled at the state level. If I were to stand in front of you and say, hey, let's get a law passed through Congress, you'd all groan internally. You'd be like, oh, I thought all of this was about how Congress isn't working. It's true. But all of these primaries are controlled at the state level in large part because the parties are made up. There is nothing in the Constitution, not a word about political parties. George Washington detested political parties, tried to warn against them on his way out. John Adams said two parties would be an evil upon the land in 1780. The Republican Party doesn't even exist until after the Civil War. It started out as a northern anti-slave party. And the duopoly at that point started divvying up the spoils and saying, let's play you lose, I lose, you lose, I lose, while the people are the ones who are doing the losing. But because none of this is at the federal level, it's all at the state level, which means we can change it. The way they did it in Alaska is they had a ballot initiative where a bunch of Alaskans got together and said, let's make this change. And then it was so. And in 24 other states around the country, they have the same exact thing. What do you think about marching around the country and trying to free up legislators so they can be rewarded for being sane and reasonable, New York? I just wish that New York was a ballot initiative state. But it's not. Maybe it will be, who knows? Maybe we can make that happen. There are some people in this room I know who wanna make that happen. And I will say that New York it is an emblem of one party rule. I'm just gonna share a couple of numbers from my mayoral. So 900,000 people voted in the Democratic primary that I was a participant in. Maybe that sounds like a lot, it was actually higher turnout than the years before. But in a city of 8.3 million or more, 9.3 million, about 10 or 11% of New Yorkers effectively decided who the next mayor was. That's really, really low in the scheme of things. And if you were an independent or Republican who wanted to vote in that primary, you couldn't, unless you had registered four months before, which by the way, would have been very, very unusual for someone who was, who was independent or Republican to do. So this is the norm in elections around the country, and this is what we have to change. We have to actually open it up. We have to free up the system so that People get rewarded for trying to deliver for the general public instead of the most partisan among us. So this is the case that I have now committed to making for people around the country. And it's a winning case because we all see that it's not working right now. The duopoly is designed just to, to clash and clash while the rest of us wonder what happened to our country. It turns out that 62% of us want an alternative to the duopoly, but we keep being told we can't have one. We keep being told that, oh, you're gonna mess it up. You're gonna mess it up for someone else. And I do wanna touch on very briefly that anyone who's concerned about the spoiler effect, all we need to do is move to ranked choice voting and then the spoiler effect is solved. It's one of the reasons why New York City <laughs> heading in this direction, take it from a guy who lost a ranked choice voting election. Ranked choice voting <laughs> is the best. So this is where we are in American life right now, where there's a solution that can help free us from polarization, and we have to take this case to the rest of the country as quickly as possible. This is our only path out, in large part because I do want to put on my fortune teller hat and talk about what's coming down the pike. Who's going to run for president in 2024? I <laughs> know. Someone's looking at me with a horrified look. All right. Let's, let's check this out. So, Republican field, Donald Trump, approval rating, 65 to 80 percent, has raised over 100 million, telling people that he's probably going to run. His opponents, Ron DeSantis, who has told people privately, if Trump runs, I will not run. Nikki Haley, who has told people publicly, if Trump runs, I will not run. His likely opponents are going to be Chris Christie, <laughs> Mike Pence, Maybe Larry Hogan, I know you're laughing. <laughs> Trump probably rolls through that field. If you're a Republican figure who thinks you have a bright future, just wait out a cycle. Why would you go against Trump? I know you're shaking your head, but this is rational, right? So you have Trump coming on one side. Who's coming from the other side? In the blue corner, 
I'll be like a ring announcer. In the blue corner, out of Scranton, Pennsylvania, 81 years young. So, so Joe Biden, incumbent, defeated Trump once, most likely person for the Democrats to run. Issues, right now, running at 43% popularity uh, and getting long in the tooth. Options, Kamala Harris, your sitting vice president. Ooh. Problems, Kamala Harris consistently pulls four or five points worse than Joe. It's just math. After her, then you have a competitive primary. It's not what the party wants to do when Trump's coming up, so it leads you back to Joe Biden. So the likely scenario in 2024 is Biden-Trump, the sequel. Combined age, 158. <laughs> so this is where the country's heading, pretty quickly. I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but a lot of you are thinking this. So the question is, how do we make use of the next 12 months? <laughs> Again, all things are possible now in the United States of America. The democracy that many of us have grown up with and taken for granted, I would not take it for granted. So what can we do in the next 12 months? We have to run, not walk, but run to try and implement open primaries, ranked choice voting, and enough states around the country so you a critical mass of legislators are able to do what's right to stand up for our institutions. That is the mission, New York. And by coming here tonight, you have inherited this responsibility. I'm sorry to break this to you, but democracy rests on your shoulders. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, you're like, whoa, I just, you know, came because someone invited me. Didn't know I was going to inherit the preservation of American democracy. But it, it's true. This is a mission and a message that we need to take to the rest of the nation as quickly as possible. And I want to close on this big idea that I discovered during the trail that I think you'll all feel and resemble. I was running for president, I was doing my thing, and then a political consultant came to me and said, Andrew, you are terrible at this. You're making all of these factual appeals, it's not what people want, you have to make emotional appeals, tell stories about this person, tell them the red meat issue, and then they will applaud and they will like you. And I heard this and I was like, wow, is that right? Is this person right? But what I discovered when I was running for president is that the way I communicate, the way I'm talking to you all right now, it ended up being a new political language. A new political language that reached some people that didn't like politics, some people that <laughs> defied any kind of prior political alignment, because it turns out that right now all politics is tribal, and our politicians have figured it out. They make us angry or animated based upon the coded terms and language designed to try and inflame you against the other side. And then Andrew Yang came along and just accidentally stumbled into this new political language based upon the way I talk. What percentage of Americans do you think home in on this new language of facts, reason, solutions, in this case trying to break us through the polarization? What percent, New York? It's a lot less than 51 percent, I have to say. I think it's around 10%, which some of you may, might find you know, dis, disheartening in some way, but I'm here to tell you all, New York, and this is genuinely our mission, if we get that 10%, we win. In a polarized country, if you get 10%, you can transform politics for the better very, very quickly. How many US senators does it take to control the agenda? Two, <laughs> One. <laughs> That's true, in a polarized country, you get one senator, you can end up controlling the whole thing. It's realistic for us to get one, two, maybe even three senators in 2022. It's realistic for us to get a handful of members of Congress in 2022 to make an impact in local races around the country. This is not some far off goal in the future. This is right fucking now, New York. Are you all with me? Are you gonna fight for this democracy we love so that these are not the last days? I sure as hell am. With your help, we can make this case and spread this message to the rest of the country and move this country that our kids are going to grow up in, not left or right, but forward, which is where millions of us wanna go if we will only show them the way. Thank you so much, New York City. Thank you, let's do it.
Thank you. I love you too. Thank you very much, New York. Thank you.